Good morning. See it this time. Good morning. Welcome to Southern Hills. An exciting, it's, isn't it beautiful outside? So I, is there going to be a rule that like everybody has to sit like in this, so I, I can just preach from right here. That is cool. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we do not have, I mean, this is Memorial Sunday. Thank you so much for, for being here. And thank you for everybody online that's online. Uh, we're going to have some fun this morning. Uh, we, we are short-staffed a little bit. Uh, Don is not here. He is the regular, of course, minister here, and, and I'm filling in. He's away with his family, so uh, we, we get to let him do that once in a while. Uh, so you got me. I'm Michael Vandervorst, and uh, we'll, we're going to have some fun this morning. We're going to... Uh, like, basically, this morning's message is like a giant version of a kid's sermon. So if you like kid's sermons, this is the, we're just going to have fun today. Um, we don't have somebody to lead us in singing this morning, uh, so we're just all going to sing as loud as we can and have fun with that, but I, I already promised that I was going to turn off my mic while we're singing, so I'll turn it off, and then I'll try to sing and lead, uh, but we'll go with that. We're going to start with uh, number 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, and it will be up on the screen. Our second song this morning we'll roll right into is 314 in the garden.
ahead and have a seat. I tell you what, that was beautiful. Thank you, everyone, for, for singing so loudly on those. I, I could hear you, and it was, it was wonderful. Um, we, did, we did awesome. We're, we're a team this morning, right? Um, welcome again. Uh, I'm Michael Vandervorst, filling in this Sunday. We do have some announcements. There is a little QR code somewhere stashed on the back of the chair, and there's also a communication card. If you could fill that out, make sure we know you're here. Let us know of any prayer requests you have. That is your way to communicate to us. Uh, we're not going to take an offering mo this morning. There's offering baskets in the back. As the Lord leads you, please uh, put your gifts in the offering baskets. Uh, special thanks to all men and women, veterans. Thank you for your service. Uh, you are awesome. And this is a time when we can remember those who... Uh, who went before and, and gave their lives for our freedom and our ability to, to worship here this morning. June 12th, we're going to have one service. So June 12th is what, like two weeks from now? Because this is like practically tomorrow's June. It's not, but we're getting there. Um, so two weeks from today, we will have one service. Uh, it is Laura Sherman's last week with us, and she is going to do the message and kind of lead that, and we're going to celebrate her and all her help for us. Uh, and then following the this, this service, we'll have a potluck in the gym, and we have here last names A through K, please bring a salad to share, uh, L through Z, please bring a dessert. And I think Don is uh, wrestling up some people to do some barbecue, so if you have a barbecue and you're mobile and you want to help with that, Drop Don a note, uh, and he says we'll share. We'll have brats and hot dogs as the main entree. There you go. Uh, June 18th uh, is a, is going to be a trustees' work day, so set that aside on your calendar. If you can come out and help, there will be lots of things to do. Uh, spring cleanup here at the church, and if you're good at building fences, boy, have we got a deal for you. Uh, VBS will be August 1st through the 4th. Uh, on August 7th, we will have one service where the kids will sing their songs and do the, do the, present the VBS stuff like we normally do. And it says we'll have food trucks in the parking lot. That's new. That will be fun. Um, oh, because it's, it's a food, the, the theme for VBS is food trucks, right? Yeah, so that makes sense. So we'll just kind of like swing right into that. Uh, and SDSU ice cream. So if for nothing else, you know that that's going to be worthwhile. And that is our announcements this morning. Uh, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for all the work that uh, everybody puts into your ministry this morning. And uh, thank you for the volunteers. And I pray that you would be with those who aren't here this morning as they're out with families and uh, keep them safe and bring them back to us. And I thank you so much, God, for the veterans and for watching over our country and blessing us in that way. God, our, our freedoms, as we look at what's going on in the world, it's even more dear to us. We see the contrast and we, we know a little bit more about what our freedoms are worth. And we thank you for that. Father, I pray that as we continue in our service this morning, that we would be able to praise and worship you and uh, seek your face. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now if I grab my bulletin here, we are going to do 369, Blessed Assurance. And if you could please stand for that.
Father, we thank you for the, uh, the weather this morning. It was just so awesome to be able to walk into church and uh, that, that smell of the rain we had last night just, I don't know, warmed my soul. So thank you for that. Father, we pray that uh, you would help us to seek your face to find you this morning as we dive into your word. Uh, bless us as we continue our walk with you. Show us how we can overcome those things in our past that would distract us from you, those giants that stand between us and you. Father, you've, you've worked so hard to, uh, to break down those barriers to the point where you even, as Jesus came to earth and died on the cross so that that barrier of sin would be torn down and we would be able to walk with you, to be able to praise you and worship you and pray in your name directly. It's just awesome, God. Father, we do want to pray uh, the prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Uh, let us continue in worship and we'll sing 572, Pass It On. be seated. Shift around a little bit, find my notes. Ah, good morning again. Um, so I get to do this once in a while, and in between me doing the message, I usually have in mind some sort of sermon or something percolating, and boy, did I have a good one here for you today. Um, I had the message, I had the, the scripture picked out, the emphasis, an outline. I'd gone over it a few times in my mind over the time. 
And then when, when Don communicated me and I, I volunteered for this Sunday and I had to actually write it out, boy, it just, it wasn't happening. So maybe that's for a different day. But uh, I tried to do it and tried to do it, didn't work. So then uh, one day I had to drive down to Kansas for work. And then on the way back, driving by Lincoln, Nebraska on I-80, uh, listening to Christian music, this song came up called My Deliverer. Does anybody remember? It was a big song back in the, the early 2000s. Um, but it's a good song. One of the things about that song is it's five and a half minutes long, so it's, it's kind of long. Do you remember this song? No? Okay. Uh, okay, that's your homework. You can look up My Deliverer. Uh, anyway, but in the space of that five minutes, God gave me a message, a theme, scripture, like the emphasis, like everything. The outline, I knew exactly everything. And so I tell you what, God gave this to me for you this morning, and he really wants you to be able to enjoy this word this morning. So it's, it's, it's for you. He gave it to me for that. So I'm excited to share this. As, you know, one of the things that was going through my head during all of that is just all the craziness in the world lately. Uh, we all agree that right now the world's a little crazy. We have the, the war in Ukraine, other, other conflicts in other areas. Uh, we're, we've kind of gone from, I'm used to this, uh, an economy here of surplus to almost an economy of, you know, there's, there's just nothing in the stores in some cases. There's, we're out of baby food um, bad things going on. I haven't lived through that before in my lifetime. Uh, there's inflation that I haven't seen before. Uh, there's, there's the weather's doing some weird things. We have friends and family that uh, have, have health issues we're praying for and lifting up, all of these things. Uh, and, and honestly, I've had to not think too much, to focus too much on all these things going on because it would just break you. Right? There's, there's so many weird things right now. But then this song comes on, My Deliverer. And it's, like I say, it's a good song. It talks about Jesus, and when he was, when he was really young, his parents took him down to Egypt. And there on the, on the banks of the Nile, as the song sings, uh, that he listened to the song that the captive children used to sing, My Deliverer is Coming. He's standing by. God will never break his promise. He's written it on the sky. And it reminded me that, you know, uh, we think about Jesus often and we, and we praise him and worship him because he died for us and saved us from sin. But that isn't what his end goal was. He didn't come to earth to, to save us from sin. He came to earth to save us from sin so that he could have a relationship with us so that we could, he could break down those barriers and God could be with us. He delivered us, yes, and there's so much more than that. Jesus, son, when he was on earth, spent most of his time healing the sick, curing the pain, getting people through the trouble they were in. And now, God, if we've accepted God as our Savior, God has adopted us as children. Isn't that cool? So as I'm thinking through this, God reminded me of a, of a scripture where this one man had such unshakable faith that he was able to overcome these things that were against him literally killing a giant. Now, you know who I'm talking about. Um, so we're going to look a little bit into that battle this morning of David and Goliath, and we're going to see a little bit about his faith and what brought him through. We're going to start... Well, here. See, this is why I have an outline, so I don't forget steps. Uh, to, to set the stage, we have to know what's going on. So, as you remember, God brought up Israel out of Egypt, brought them into the promised land. For generations, he led them through judges, Samson being one of the judges. And then the 
Israel was, told God one day, like, hey, everybody else has a king. Where's our king? We want a king. How do we get a king? And God said, well, you know, first of all, I'm your king. Second, you don't want an earthly king because they'll raise taxes. They'll take all your young men, they're going to put them in an army, and they'll go to war. And you don't want that. And they said, no, 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 we really, 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 really do want a king. So God selected Saul as the first king of Israel and became the kingdom of Israel. Saul did some good stuff and then kind of drifted away from God. And in the midst of all that, then God is preparing David to be the next king. So Saul did raise taxes, he raised an army, and he went to war. And so that's where we pick up the story. His army went to a valley and encamped on one side, one hillside. And across the valley on the other hill is the army of the Philistines. Now later on, it talks early, er, in some of the earlier stories, it talks about how many men were in the army, and then later on it talks about how, some, how many men were in the army, and we don't know this battle, how many were in the army. It was probably somewhere around 50,000 men, so thousands and thousands of men standing on one hillside, and the Philistines probably had an equal number-ish on the other side. So there's a lot of men staring at across each other on this valley, making mean faces, shouting taunts, and nothing happens. And then the hero of the Philistines steps forward. We're going to pick up the story in 1 Samuel 17, verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I can overcome and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing this, the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now I skipped a bit earlier on where it introduces Goliath, but we kind of know why they're terrified, because Goliath is, like, big, right? Bigger than big. Giant, we'll say. In fact, that, that term Goliath, we've even, like, absorbed into English. If I was to say, wow, that Titanic, that's a Goliath of a ship, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. But how big was he really? Let's, I'm going to go back, and we're actually going to read that part where we introduce Goliath. So we're now going to go back to verse 4, 4 through 7. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and, his, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. That makes it so clear. Five cubits in a span. I don't even know what that is. Um, I, I, I don't know about you. I, I have problems with metrics. So, you know, when, when you're listening to somebody and they're talking meters or kilograms, like my mind doesn't have an equivalent for that. If, if you mention like it's so many kilometers to such a place, I don't know how long that is, let alone cubits and shekels and spans. It's okay though. We can do math. Okay, so Goliath, if we do the math, is nine and a half feet tall. His armor, just the scale shirt, weighs over 90 pounds. His spear, the, the, the iron head of his spear, weighed 16 pounds, probably the spear altogether, which was 12 feet long, okay, weighed about 30 pounds. So his entire armor kit, 
probably weighs, the, the armor probably weighs about 120, and then with all his gear, his sword and his javelin and his spear and all of this, now we're looking at like 180 pounds. So he's going into battle with an extra 180 pounds. He's not only nine and a half feet tall, giant, he has the strength to go with that. Okay? But how many people here have ever met someone that's nine and a half feet tall? We still can't get that in our brain, can we? It's weird. Never fear. I brought Goliath with me this morning. Here we go. So, now since most people are on this other side, we're going to put him over here. No, no, no. See if we can stand him up there. He's so big, yeah. Okay, so his, the top of his head is nine and a half feet off the ground. By the way, feel free to come up afterwards and like take a picture with Goliath because he's ginormous, right? That's what the army's looking at. He's nine and a half feet tall and he has the strength to go with it. And Ah, if I can do this without breaking anything. He's got a 12-foot spear with a 16-pound iron head on it. And he's ready to hurl this at the first person that comes out of the battle line. That's a... He's big. That's a long way up there. So we'll give Goliath his spear here. Well, there you go. Nah, there we go. Stay, stay. Okay, so let's look now. Well, first of all, Goliath didn't just give that challenge once. He did it every morning and every afternoon for 40 days. So for 80 times, he stood forth and gave his challenge and cursed the God of Israel and defied the army, and every time they shook in their boots and Saul cowered in his tent, and nobody would come out. And I think the morale of the army just dropped a notch every time. Okay. And I think if it would have continued, the army would have just eventually broken ran. Because they weren't going to fight him. But then what happens? God has a different plan, right? There's this young man named David who comes into the story. So let's talk a little bit about who David was. One, one kind of error that I, that I want to try to correct this morning is a lot, of, a lot of times when we see pictures of this battle and somebody artistically represented, David is a little boy. And I think they do that to have like a bigger contrast. But he's nine and a half feet tall. You don't have to fake the contrast between David and Goliath, right? Um, David is a full-grown man at this point. He's a young man, probably 16, 17, 18 years old. But, I mean, like, we send 18-year-olds off to battle, right? So some of you did that. Um, so, I mean, he's a young man, but he's a man. So let's go back to when the, the Bible kind of introduces David at one point. Um, if I can talk about Saul for a second. Saul, as, as, as God pulled back from Saul, Saul was taken over at times by these fits of madness where he'd go to a dark place, he'd get really angry, he'd throw things and nobody could get him out of these moods where he was just super violent and dark and, and mad. And then one day, one of his servants was like, hey, I know a guy. So we're going to back up to 1 Samuel chapter 16, the, ch the chapter before, where the servant describes David to Saul. He says, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem, who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. This is the chapter before the battle. He's already described as a brave man and a warrior. So again, he's, he's young, but he's a man. Um, so David would go to court, 
when Saul had these moods and play for him, and it would calm him, and he'd return to sanity. So David and Saul have already met. They already are very, very familiar with each other. In fact, David has become Saul's personal shield bearer. So they already have a close relationship. So David, when he's not in Saul's court, helping out Saul, he's, he's a, a loyal young man, and he goes back to his dad's farm, and he helps with the flocks. So he's been going back and forth. At this time, again, Saul took his army and left town and went off to this valley to fight a battle, even though they're really not fighting a battle for 40 days. That's the intent. And I can just see David at home, hanging out, and he's just like fidgeting, like, ah, you know. His older three brothers are in the battle line, and he just like, you know, he's a, he's a young warrior. He wants, he wants to know what's going on. He wants to, there, you know, there's, there's no Facebook. He can't like, you know, his brothers can't be like, this is what we had for breakfast in camp this morning. Um, so he's got to go, and, and his dad, seeing this, says, you know, David, why don't you take some food to your brothers? Okay. And so he grabs some food and he runs off to the army. And he gives the food to the quartermaster. He's supposed to give it to his brothers. He just like, first guy he comes across, like, here's some food. And then he runs down to the battle line. And he happens to be there when Goliath steps forward and issues his 80th challenge. And David freaks. He's the first guy to be like, what are, why are we still standing here? You know, didn't, didn't, I'm sure Saul, like, offered, like, some reward if you'd step forward and, and, like, go fight this guy. Like, what's going on? Why isn't anybody fighting Goliath? And his brothers get mad and tell him to go away. You're not in the army. Go away. Um, let us handle this. We know what's going on. But Saul gets word that David's out in the camp asking all these questions. And so he calls David to him. And David walks into his tent, and the very first thing he says, don't fear, I'll go fight Goliath. And Saul says, yeah, yeah no. Because he's afraid of Goliath. He's been literally, like, terrified for 40 days. And here's this young man walking in, like, I'll go fight him. Eh, no, you don't understand. Like, he's, he's, he's big. Like, he's, he's been a warrior his whole life. Look at his spear. And David says, no, you know, God's with me. I can do this. Okay. Well, then Saul offers to have him wear his own, shield, his own armor and use his sword. And David tries it on. And he says, I can't, I can't use this stuff. He walks around, he's like, it, I, it's, I haven't tested it. Has anybody here had, ever had an opportunity to try on, like, heavy armor? Or, or if you've been in the army, like, wear, like, the armor plates or stuff. Um, go ahead and put up the picture. So this is, this is Rob, one of my friends, and that's his suit of heavy armor that he fights in. Uh, with like sticks and hitting other people for real and he won this is years ago before children so quite a ways but he let me try it on and I got to battle one day in his armor so it's just like David I'm using somebody else's armor and actually it's very similar he's got it kind of hard to see but it's a scale armor it's little plates all leather strapped together and he's got the helmet and uh, greaves and like the whole bit and this big stick to hit people with. Um, that, I did not do well. It was fun, but I didn't do so well. It's not my armor. You know, you got this thing in front of your nose and you don't, you don't have peripheral vision. Rob fights in it all the time. And so like he knows like, you know, move your head around so you can still see what's going on in the battlefield. He's tested his armor. He knows the weight. He can carry it. He knows how to move. It's different. Okay. But David is not used to wearing armor, just like I wasn't used to wearing armor. You stumble over yourself. So you're better off without. So he says, no, I can't use it. 
But I think there is something else going on in the background that God would have never, ever, ever let David step onto the battlefield in Saul's armor. Because he would have won because he had the faith. But if he stepped forward and defeated Goliath in Saul's armor with Saul's sword, guess what? Who defended David? Saul. Who fought, Gol- who fought Goliath? Saul's sword. If he would have done that, it wouldn't have been God's victory. It would have been Saul's. So not allowed. You cannot wear armor. But that's okay. It wasn't David's plan anyway. So let's read what he does bring into battle. Skipping up to verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, with his sling in his hand, and approached the Philistine. So now let's see how these two warriors balance out. Goliath, and you can put up my... there. Goliath, glass statistics here. Goliath has 90 pounds of armor on. He's got a 12-foot spear, a javelin, and a sword. He has years of experience, and oh, by the way, he's nine and a half feet tall and has the strength to go with it. David, on the other hand, what does David bring into battle? A stick, a sling, five rocks, and faith in God. Which one would you rather be? Saul's thinking, everybody in the army is like, I'd rather be, you know, the nine-foot-tall guy with the, with the 12-foot spear. Again, like, that's, that's huge. Um, so let's, let's see what happens here as these two warriors face each other. I'm just going to read it straight out of Scripture. It's a cool story, and I think, uh, I think it's written well. So read it, read it right there. We're going to pick up uh, then in verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bare in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I give... I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from his sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Quite the turn of events. So there's three things that I want us to note out of that battle. One is that it was a spiritual battle, and David's the only one that understood that. They were both swearing by their gods, declaring things in the name of their gods, but David was really the only one that took it to heart. The entire Israelite army just saw the physical battle. David understood he had a deliverer. And I think that's important to us to remember. All David had to do was show up. He didn't have any experience as a, as a warrior. He hadn't gone to battle. He wasn't trained. He didn't know how to wear armor. He didn't know how to swing a sword. 
So he just stood up there with a stick and a rock, and God made it happen. The battle belonged to, the God, to God. The second thing that is interesting to me is that everything David said came true. He struck him down that day. He cut off his head that day. And as the Philistine army fled, the Israelite army got up and chased them and chased him down. And it was a bad day for the Philistine army. So everything he said came true. The third thing, and I, and I feel a little bit like Columbo here. Do you remember, everybody remember Columbo? They're like, he'd be quizzing somebody you know, and they'd, they'd, he'd be annoying Columbo. He's, but if you don't know Columbo, he's a TV detective. And so he'd be interviewing somebody, and, and they'd be telling him all these lies and whatever, whatever, whatever. And then he'd be like, okay, okay, I'm done. I'll leave you alone. And he gets to the door, and he opens the door, and he steps out. And he's like, but one more thing. Why did you bring five rocks? That's weird, isn't it? Why five? If David had all this faith to take down a giant, why did he, I mean, because it wasn't that, I, I don't think it was that he thought he needed more than one to take down Goliath. And it wasn't some random number because the Bible specifically says five. For, so for some reason, five is important. So if you're going to kill Goliath, and you have faith in that, why pick up four extra? Well, if you keep reading, and the stories for this time are in First and Second Samuel and then in Chronicles, and the two sets of books kind of overlap and kind of tell the same stories. So there's multiple stories about the same events, and if you try to line them all up and compare like this one to that one, you get a picture that develops, and they, and you can see where they mention time and time again that Goliath had brothers. So as David's approaching the battle line, he's walking down off that hill and he comes across the stream and he starts picking up stones. He picks up stones because he's going to fight Goliath. And oh, by the way, across the valley on that other hillside is the entire Philistine army, including all of Goliath's brothers. So he knows that if I kill Goliath, I may have to fight them all today. So now I'm going to get the, the names right. So I'm going to use my cheat sheet here. So he has his, his little shepherd's bag, right? And he sticks five stones in it. So we have one smooth stone for Goliath. We have one smooth stone for his brother, Lammy. We have one smooth stone for his brother, Ishbi Benab. We have one smooth stone for his brother, Sippai. And we have one smooth stone for his brother, Axodotlus. Five giants, five stones. Not only did David, was he absolutely certain, I'm going to take down Goliath today. But if his brothers want to avenge him today, I'm prepared, and I have one for each. He was ready to take down five giants. And he would have done it. But they ran. And then over the scriptures we read how basically him and his army hunted down every brother of Goliath and killed them all over time. God won. So what does this mean for us? Well, we have a deliverer too, right? And all those giants in our lives I mentioned earlier, the struggles going on, the health issues that we see, Again, God and G Jesus came to earth to save us from sin so that our deliverer could have a relationship with us, so that he could call us his children. It's the same God that walked with David into the battlefield. All David had to do was show up. He didn't have to bring a sword. He just had to bring God. So I encourage you 
these things that are our giants that are trying to distract us from God, these things that are our giants that are trying to make us fear, to make us ashamed, to make us terrified. Bring them to prayer. Bring them in prayer to God. God is our deliverer. He wants to walk with us just like he walked with David. That's why Jesus died, not to forgive us our sins, but so God could be our father, to break down that barrier, to break down the wall so that we could call on him in prayer. Isn't that awesome? The same God that, that David knew he'd take him down. I think that we can, we can have that faith, rely on God. You want to come back up and we'll end with our song? So I'll, I'll, I'll pray as, as we get ready here. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for the story of David and his just unshakable faith, silly faith, that he, he just put all his, his belief in you. He was just going to go do anything because he knew that you wanted it to happen. Father, I pray that we would step forward in faith, that we would be part of your kingdom, that you're working. Show us where you're moving and help us to be there and help us to show up even with our little stick and our five rocks. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and stand and we will sing 707, Hymn of Promise. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. Go therefore in faith and enjoy your memorial weekend. Amen.